Okay, it's uh, 3.03 right now, so I want to call uh, the Committee on the Environment, Climate, and Legacy to order. Uh, it's February 9th, 3.03 .03 at the moment. Um, we're still short of one person to be, in quorum, to be under quorum, but uh, as soon as we have quorum, I will announce that. So um, today, we only have one bill, um, but number of testifiers. Um, and that bill is Senate File 73. Um, maybe members or other may wonder why that bill is here in the uh, Environment, Climate, and Legacy Committee. There's a few articles, and later counsel here, uh, Mr. Stanley can explain, and also the author can explain too. Uh, there is some provision that involve waters and uh, satellite waste, and also DNR and uh, MPCA. In short, in short summary, that's the reason that the bill traveled through this committee. This is the fifth committee uh, that this bill, Senate 573, uh, uh, has passed through. Uh, it will be a couple more until, um, or several more. It's going to travel through a total of 18 committees uh, until it reached the Senate floor. Um, so we want to keep the top topic or for the testifier to keep within the, uh, the to keep the discussion within this jurisdiction, um, and I will make sure that uh, testimony are under that, um, and counsel also going to help me keep ears and eye open so that we uh, are on the issue under this jurisdiction of environment. A climate and legacy. So here with us is Senator Port. Senator Port, um, before that, we now have quorum. So Senator Port, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, the Senate file. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Her, uh, Senator Lindsay Port. I am uh, pleased to be with you, committee members, um, to present Senate File 73, the Adult Use Cannabis Legalization Bill. Prohibition of cannabis is a failed system that has not achieved the desired goals and has incredible costs for communities, especially for communities of color. We have an opportunity to start the process to undo some of the harm that has been done and to create a system of regulation that works for Minnesota consumers and businesses while ensuring an opportunity in this new market for communities that have been most affected by prohibition. Our main goals with this bill are to legalize, regulate and expunge, and we're working to ensure that this legislation does just that. This bill establishes an Office of Cannabis Management to oversee the regulation of cannabis and cannabinoid products and transfers the medical cannabis program to the new office. It establishes a Cannabis Advisory Council, requires specific studies and reports, and sets up a statewide monitoring system. The bill also creates an approval process for cannabis and hemp-derived consumer products, establishes plant propagation standards and agricultural best practices and environment standards. Additionally, the bill provides legal limits for adult use cannabis products, establishes 14 categories of licenses and related fees and legal framework. We establish a social equity program to ensure that the communities most harmed by prohibition have an opportunity to engage in the industry provide grower grants, and invest in a substance use disorder advisory council. Senate File 60, 73 sets the tax rate for cannabis products, provides business and development grant programs, sets up an automatic expungement program, as well as an expungement panel for higher level offenses, and puts in temporary regulation changes needed for the products we legalized last year. We also provide guidelines around the testing, packaging, labeling, and advertising. This bill is comprehensive, to say the least. And we'll, we will absolutely have changes from now until we see this bill on the floor. The committee process in this bill is critically important, and we have reached out to all members of this committee and other committees we have met with before to encourage um, that amendments are brought to our attention and discussed with us so that we can work together to make sure that we put forward the best bill possible. Over the next month or so, uh, as Senator Hur said, uh, this bill will have a total of 18 committee stops. We hope that through this process, we can work together with each other and with the stakeholders to get a final product that works best for Minnesota. 
Today, in the Environment, Climate, and Legacy Committee, the jurisdiction of the bill is relatively small. Though it encompasses different articles, the portions of the bill that are covered in this committee really come down to a couple of things. Uh, it, it, in, section one, in Article 1, Section 3, uh, the bill adds the Pollution Control Agency Commissioner or a designee to the Cannabis Advisory Council. In Article 1, Section 8, it requires the Office of Cannabis Management to work in consultation with the PCA in creating uh, water standards and solid waste standards for cannabis businesses. In Article 1, Section 21, it requires applicants for cannabis cultivator license to submit a plan to address how wastewater and water disposal would be handled. Uh, the same is true in Article 1, Section 23 for cannabis manufacturing licenses and in Article 1, Section 33 for cannabis microbusiness license. These are things that are very common uh, amongst industries, but as we're setting up a new industry, we want to ensure that those uh, waste and water disposal uh, pieces are covered correctly. Um, it also uh, ensures that the, has the storage of hazardous materials, uh, that an approval plan is submitted prior to licensing, um, and uh, that the there is an appropriation to the Department of Natural Resources uh, to facilitate implementation of the act uh, and also to the P Pollution Control Agency. I will note that those uh, appropriations are blank at this moment. We are still waiting for the fiscal note uh, and we did not want to put in numbers at this point that could change. So we um, we'll be adding in those numbers once we have them, and that will be specifically gone over. This bill will go to finance at the end, uh, where we'll be, we will be discussing all of the appropriations. Uh, and I, I welcome if council has additional uh, jurisdiction comments you'd like to make. Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chair, members, good afternoon. Senator Port did a better job than I would have done. I have nothing to add other than to say that uh, in member packets you'll find a double-sided one-page document that uh, contains the same information that she just went over. Uh, Senator Port, any um, additional remark? Uh, just thank you for your time, Chair and committee members. Um, I, I think there are a number of testifiers here today, and I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Senator Port. And on our agenda here, within the Senate 5, some, 73, we'll have public testimony and after that, um, followed by amendments, if there's any, uh, and member can uh, uh, have discussion and questions. So for testifier, um, uh, just come forward to the front here. I will call your name, and uh, you will we'll give you limited time based on our jurisdiction, depending on how many people will be uh, testifying. So first on the agenda here for testimony is Mr. Sean Weber. Uh, please come to the front and uh, introduce yourself and what organization you represent. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee, Senator Port. Uh, my name is Sean Weber. I am the owner operator of Crested River Cannabis Company as well as the president of the Hemp Growers Cooperative. Um, to try and proactively address some questions and concerns that you may have in regards to the environmental impact of cannabis, it, it's pretty straight and clear when we relegate this conversation to a craft market, but you open up Pandora's box when you start talking about bulk corporate grows. So typically in a craft um, realm, there's virtually no wastewater because they're only using the amount of water necessary for the plant. Um, when we're doing indoor grows, uh, we're not affecting any pollinators. However, we are increasing the electricity use. Um, there's no documented information that says that the increased energy use would have an effect on our grid. This is not California. This is not the Pacific Northwest. Also in regards to aquifer um, endangerment, um, when we deal with aquifers, it's only relative to outdoor grows. Uh, cannabis is a phytoremediatory plant. That means it actually cleans up the soil. 
it pulls heavy metals and toxins from our aquifers. And so it actually has a negative carbon footprint. Um, it actually sequesters carbon in its shoots and its leaves. So if we're dealing with industrial hemp, we can actually incorporate that into our crop rotation, improve the soil health, um, future, in, future limiting the amount of amendments of fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and we're actually sequestering carbon um, within the plant and in the soil. So um, this is a very extensive and complex conversation and topic. Um, Minnesota is unique. We, we do not have the natural resource issues that other states have. But at the end of the day, a lot of these abuses and environmental issues are relative to corporate bulk growing operations. And a, and a small craft um, arrangement has little to no environmental impact. So um, I just wanted to offer that. There's a lot more that I would like to offer, but um, I respect the committee's time. So thank you. And members, you know, I will be a little flexible on, on asking questions to the testifier, being that we had a number of them lined up, and so we don't, you know, uh, we want to be efficient, so uh, feel free to ask questions uh, by raising your hand, and I'll let you uh, ask your question to um, whoever the testifier is. And so uh, thank you, Mr. Weber, and uh, um, I'll call... The next person up will be Mr. Tad Galati from Industrial Hemp Farmers. And please um, introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, committee chair. Thank you, committee. Welcome. My name is Ted Galati. I'm the owner operator of Willows Keep Farm in Zimbrota, Minnesota. We started in 2018 and we grow Hemp Maze, Minnesota, where we educate and inform the public about the robust industry of industrial hemp, but also cannabis. Um, we also added can of disc golf, so now you can play disc golf through a cannabis field. And we have the Old Pine Theater, which is our performing arts theater, and that's where we sell some of our products, and we have a farm store that's open year-round at the farm where we sell our products. The reason I'm here today, obviously this is climate, environment, and legacy. Um, just like Sean said, the plant is an amazing plant not only medicinally, but there's a nutritional aspect. It's the only plant that can shelter you, clothe you, feed you, and heal you. No other plant can do that. However, the way this bill is written, 363 times hemp is listed in this bill. 63 times marijuana is listed in this bill. So right now I'm questioning whether this is a hemp bill or I know it's cannabis adult use bill, but a marijuana recreational bill. And I'm kind of concerned for my farm and what we do. We also sell CBD and CBG products and now low potency THC, which we were selling before because that was a full spectrum product that was federally legal. So my concern to all of you and to all the legislators is really think before you vote. This is a nonpartisan um, topic and yes, I do think we need more access to the plant. It is about health and it's about nutrition and it's about so much more than that. But please don't ruin my farm and my family's operation. And I just really need you to all read the 300 plus pages of this bill and really make appropriate decisions moving forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Galati. And uh, question from members. Thank you, and points well taken. Um, I'm sure the author, Senator Port, will um, uh, put that into some consideration as the bill moving forward. So thank you for your testimony, Mr. Galati. And the next testifier here, testifier here uh, need no introduction. As we all know, uh, before the time of serving as a governor of our state and the time he served as a governor. So, but. Uh, Got to go along with formality here. Uh, I want to call uh, Governor, Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura to the desk. And uh, for the record, Governor, you might have to introduce yourself. <laughs> Perhaps spell your name too. <laughs> First of all, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a thrill for me to be here because I don't think in my four years as governor I ever testified in front of a Senate committee. 
So I'm breaking new ground here, so I hope you'll all bear with me and enjoy it. Now, I do want to set the table a little bit. I could get a little longer than what the two minutes allocates, but I remember when I first became governor and we were driving to an event and I was late. And I turned to my security guys, I said, oh, we're going to be late. And my security looked back at me and says, Governor, no, you need to understand the rules. The governor's not late. Everyone else is just early. <laughs> <laughs> so having said that, if I go over the two minutes, bear that in mind. Um, I'm, I'm here because I started this. And as governor, I believed in hemp and cannabis back then. I believe in it even more now. And I want to be here. I'm still alive. I'm still kicking. And I want to be here when this passes into law, because this is accumulation of a vision that I had over 20 years ago. And now it's coming to hopefully fruition, whatever the word is, it's going to happen, hopefully. But I want to tell you two stories why I'm so passionate about cannabis and hemp. And I please want you to listen to them. First story is this, cannabis saved my life. Let me sink that in. Not me personally, but the 38th First Lady of Minnesota. And if I get choked up a little, bear with me. It was about 10 years ago, First Lady Terry Ventura started suffering from late stage um, seizures, late in life seizures. She was seizing two to three times a week. And these were the type of seizures where you can't do anything but comfort the person, make sure they're breathing, make sure they're not swallowing their tongue, everything like that. Our life was over. We went to the doctors. They put her on four different seizure medicines. First one did not work. First two did not work. Third one did not work. Fourth one did not work. All had bad side effects. In desperation, we broke the law. We drove to Colorado. I have friends there that I met in my home in Mexico. And when we got there, my wife seized in the hotel the night before we got there. When we arrived there, uh, our friends went in, they had the ability, they bought the cannabis, three drops under the tongue, right? My wife took the first three drops under the tongue and has not had a seizure since. None. Marijuana cannabis stopped the seizures. Not our medicine. Now what did we face? I had to break the law. My friends had to send it to me in Minnesota. Well, I kind of took the attitude of Dirty Harry Callahan when I said, well, then the law's wrong because I'm putting my wife ahead of Minnesota law. And I'll admit that today. I did. So we got our, what we needed. Minnesota finally legalized, quote, medical. My wife qualified immediately, got it. But you know what the story is then? Because we're so restrictive, and that's what you're here to change today, hopefully, because it's so restrictive, it costs me $600 a month to keep my wife seizure-free. Insurance won't pay for it. Nobody will pay for what works. They'll pay for what don't work, but they won't pay for what worked. And today, my wife, it's now, because you've expanded, it's down to 300 a month now. If it was Colorado, it would be $50 a month. Why? Because in spirit of true capitalism, when you get more out there, it drives prices down. That's what capitalism's supposed to do, drive prices down. The way you're set up today, you got a monopoly in Minnesota. I don't know who's providing, whatever, but if you open up the doors, capitalism will take hold. Prices will go down. I don't want no other family to have to go through what my family went through. I don't want anyone to have to do that, what I went through. My son Tyrell, what was the other thing? Oh, I know. Then here's the other thing. 
And this is a little off the subject, but it's still going to tie in. You're going to have to come up with an age, right? How old are the people going to be when you approve this? Well, we're going to go back in my life then, 50 years ago. At 18, I went into the United States Navy. 18. I spent one year being trained and became a Navy SEAL. I then deployed to Southeast Asia and Vietnam for a nine-month deployment. While I was in BUDS training, underwater demolition SEAL training, I turned 19. While I was deployed on my first deployment to Vietnam, I turned 20. I returned home. Within one week, I went into my executive officer and I demanded to go back to Vietnam. He looked at me and said, but you just got home, you can't do that. He said, Navy requirements, you gotta be six months out of the combat zone before you can go back in. Then he asked the question, what is the problem? And I said, here's the problem, sir. I said, over there, I'm a man. Here, I'm a child. I had done all of that, nine months came back, and I could not drink a beer on Orange Avenue because I was under 21. I couldn't even vote for who sent me to Vietnam because voting was 21 then. I wasn't old enough. What did I learn from that? Gee, I guess we send children to war, don't we? Isn't that a form of child abuse? I would classify it that. Today, I suffer a little post-traumatic stress, and it's from that. It's from knowing my country sent a child to war, and it still exists today. So pick your age. Are you an adult at 18? It seems to me you should be. If you are able to go kill for your country or be killed for your country, and you're old enough to do that, you ought to be old enough to smoke a joint. You're an adult, and all I'm lecturing you on is this. Government, get consistent. Come up with the age, whatever it is, and then stand by it. Don't have it be 18 here, 21 here, and I've even heard talk of 25 for cannabis. <clears throat> Give me a break. I can tell you this unconditionally. I've behaved far worse on alcohol than I ever have on cannabis. Thank you, uh, Governor. The only bad thing I did on cannabis, I went and saw Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And no, no clapping mem members and uh, also uh, folks in the audience. And thank you, Governors, and uh, you're a very thank you. eloquent and very captivating uh, speaker as well. And thank you for bringing the service in Vietnam and also uh, relate to minor. You know, I, I can connect to that very well, being a person among descent where a large part of my uh, community, my elder actually recruited as child soldier, you know, much younger than 18, but thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I guess I should have stayed for questions. Yes, Were there members. Any? <laughs> members. Uh, I was a bit questions? rude, I apologize, I didn't realize. Any questions at any all? Any questions from members? And why I came here today? It's like I said, I don't want any family to have to go through what me and my wife, the first lady, have gone through. And cannabis saved our life. Saved it. Where would we be today? I'd be running home right now if my wife was still alive watching her seas again. Because our medicine couldn't help. Could not help. Thank you. Did. Yeah, and thank you, Governor. I know that, um, I don't know if you have testified in other committee, but I'm. Um, we're honored that you pick our Thank you, and as I said, Chairman, you're the first. Okay, <laughs> take the environment, climate, legacy uh, to tell your story. And so, um, okay, uh, next on the list uh, here is Mr. Tom Evanstead. Please come forth to, to the desk. And the reason I, you know, allow Governor to go because he, what, he, he was a governor, and I think when you're a governor of Minnesota, you're always going to be governor of Minnesota, just like Senator, we carry the name forward. Um, and not just that, uh, folks, the only th delay will be folks that are online, and there's about six of them, I think they're okay for Governor Ventura to take a little bit of his time. So next, uh, Mr. Tom Imanstad, uh please um, uh, introduce yourself. 
Thank you, Senator. Um, it's an honor to be here today. Um, this is a very historic day, um, as Governor Ventura rightly, rightly stated. Um, the reason I'm here today is um, cannabis has had a tremendous impact on my life. Um, as I testified in a previous Senate hearing, um, my sister went down at age 16. I grew up in Edina um, to pick up, you know, a little bit of weed, a joint or two. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, she wound up going to people that were the gateway. So I'm here today to say that cannabis itself is not the gateway. Cannabis uh, is referenced in Genesis seed-bearing plants for, for man, and has previous testimony, there is not one plant. Ted Galati is right. It's unique. Um, so in terms of brevity, in my written testimony, um, I included uh, the Cannabis Bible. It's written by a man named Jack Herer. No person on earth has gone around the entire earth and talked with different cultures and researched and knows more. Uh, God rest his soul, he's gone now. But I've included the entire PDF of the book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And I respectfully urge all of the committee members, everybody who's gonna vote on this bill, um, on both sides of the aisle, to educate themselves. Um, I'm employed in the cannabis um, industry. I'm an educator, um, I do strain reviews. Um, and then the other thing that I wanna say today and I'll close with this, is that in my written testimony, um, I alluded to my perception of how cannabis affects me in terms of my ability to drive under the influence of cannabis. I'm here today to tell the committee and to tell the entire world that I do not recommend that for anyone. My own particular uh, physiology, the cannabis plant, every person in this room, everybody on the earth, has an endocannabinoid system. And I guess mine works pretty well. Um, and so within my written testimony, when I talked about I have driven and driven and driven under the influence of cannabis, and thank God I've not ever had an accident, I've never even had a ticket, I'm only really putting that out there um, as the alcohol took my 25-year-old nephew. And I'm sure everybody in this room has an alcohol-related tragedy. So I'm just urging this committee to please support the legislation, and let's turn Minnesota from blood red, alcohol, to green health and love and life, cannabis. Thank you very much for your time and God bless you all. Thank you, thank you Mr. Emmerstadt. And um, can you still remain seated? Um, I don't know if I asked, My I did apologies. ask everyone to state their name for the record, but oh, maybe I'm some missed, missed it. So please say your name and, uh, for the record. And I don't know if I pronounced your last name correctly, but please. Thank you, Senator, I appreciate that. It's yeah. Thomas Evanstad, E-V-E-N-S-T-A-D. I go by Tom, Tom Evanstad. Okay, any question from members? All right, thank you, Mr. Evanstad. Thank you very much, God bless. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're gonna go to our remote testimonies. Um, first on the list here on our remote testimony is Dr. Clement Dabney. And Dr. Dabney, do state your name for the record as well. Um, if need to, go ahead and spell your, your, your last name. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Clement Dabney. Uh, that's D-A-B-N-E-Y. I earned my master's in plant breeding and molecular genetics from the College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences, and my PhD in cannabis, molecular genetics, and genomics from the College of Biological Sciences at the University of Minnesota. I would like to thank the Senate Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy for granting me time to testify in favor of passing HF73. While earning my PhD at the University of Minnesota, I contributed to writing of the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources, LCCMR grant, which selected and funded the project entitled Implementing Hemp Crop Rotation to Improve Water Quality. Cannabis has shown potential to improve surface and groundwater quality and restore soil integrity within conventional crop rotation systems. Cannabis is a deep-rooted plant that scavenges excess nutrients, prevents runoff, and reduces leaching of agricultural inputs, especially nitrogen, while further contributing organic matter to the soil horizon. Uh, the University of Minnesota is implementing cannabis into conventional crop rotation systems to, to, to achieve desired water quality and soil health outcomes. 
Since cannabis is a deeply rooted crop, it contributes organic matter, providing more stable, longer lasting soil organic carbon, allowing cannabis to deposit atmospheric carbon into the soil, creating what is known as a carbon sink. Studies have shown cannabis also has the potential to phytoremediate soils of heavy metals, such as cadmium and lead, which are found in high concentrations at sulfide mine sites in northeastern Minnesota. Cadmium and lead are two of 10 toxins the World Health Organization lists as most harmful to human health. Studies also show cannabis can phytoremediate astrazine, which is a commonly used herbicide to kill weeds and corn and has contaminated water sources in Minnesota and high concentrations of atrazine in water have been shown to be harmful to human health. SF73 has language which will mitigate pesticide pollution by requiring licensees to describe their pest management protocols and that final products must be tested and free of pesticides which degrade the environment and are damaging to human health. These measures in SF73 will act to ensure growers, manufacturers, and retailers to produce and sell pesticide-free products which will reduce the impact of cannabis cultivation on the environment. In conclusion, the, the legalization of cannabis will have significantly less negative environmental impact than other conventionally farmed crops, as well as significantly less environmental in, impact compared to other industries such as industrial factories, transportation, power plants, and sulfide mining. And I urge the passage of SF73 by the committee, and I appreciate the time to testify. Thank you, Dr. Dapney, uh, for your testimony. Any questions from members? Oh, yes, uh, Senator Wisenberg. Thank you, Chair. Um, I did have one question about the heavy metal uptake uh, in, in cannabis. Um, so if it takes these heavy, heavy metals in from the soil, um, are these going to be then inhaled through um, people who are smoking the plant? Thank you. Dr. Daphne? Uh, tr traditionally, when um, you use cannabis, um, to, I guess, um, phytoremediate sites that are high in these heavy metals, you would then um, f find ways to dispose of that, that plant material. That, that plant material would not be used in, in products. Uh, does, that, does, that, does that help? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dabney. Thank you. Okay. Any question? Good. Thank you, Dr. Dabney, for your presentation. I also answer one of the questions. And... Uh, um, Feel free to stay online and listen as we go to the next uh, testifier. Angela Dawson, um, 40 Acres Coop. Um, please uh, introduce your name for the record and uh, <clears throat> yep, spelling, spell the last name as well. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair and Committee. My name is Angela Dawson. D-A-W-S-O-N. I am a founder and president of the 40 Acre Cooperative. The 40 Acre Co-op is the first national black-led cooperative since the Reconstruction era. It's the only black indigenous-led farmer cooperative in the region. We create regional hubs that stimulate economic and educational progress for farmers who have been left out of traditional agricultural resources over the past century. I'm also the president of The Great Rise. The Great Rise is Minnesota's first equity-focused cannabis policy advocacy coalition. Um, and we're working um, to create options to make sure that the people who were most harmed by the war on drugs and the prohibition of cannabis are also put in a position where they can benefit from the legalization of cannabis in the state of Minnesota. Um, <clears throat> I'm speaking in, in uh, support of HF73. Uh, I'm, I'm also, I did mention, a fourth generation farmer. I've been farming on these lands for uh, at least five generations in Minnesota on my mother's side, four generations on my father's side in the region. And we have always used sustainable and organic practices. Today, I work with organic and regenerative farmers across the state who invest significant time and financial resources to operate farms with little or no access to profitable markets that allow them to be sustainable on the land. This is where we believe that cannabis can address the gap of economic opportunity for small and um, independent farmers uh, by introducing a viable crop for rural communities that can allow us to steward the land in responsible ways while also creating um, economic opportunities for our families, neighborhoods, and communities. We support the bill and want to emphasize the environmental benefits of growing 
growing cannabis, including its widely known negative carbon footprint and how the plant cleans and improves soil health and negates the need for chemical fertilizers. Uh, 40 Acre Co-op is also currently conducting research under a USDA regional sustainable ag and research grant for farmers and ranchers to study further how um, growing cannabis in our climate uh, using different hoop house technologies can extend the growing season and help benefit farmers. Uh, we're also uh, considering another uh, proposal to study further the carbon sequestering properties of hemp and cannabis. In general, the value and profit margins that the plant offers for cultivators is far beyond the value of most typical produce and crops grown in our state. I have much more that I can share on the topic, but I'll conclude now with appreciation uh, to the chair and to the, community, uh, to the committee and Senator Port for the opportunity to speak on the bill, and I'll stick around for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dawson. Any question from members to Ms. Dawson? Thank you, Ms. Dawson, for sharing, um, talk about your organization and uh, the mission that you do to push for equity here. Um, Next on our agenda is uh, Mr. Tom Coulter um, from Sp Superior Cannabis Company. Um, Mr. Mr. Coulter, please introduce yourself for the record. Yes, hi. I am a fourth generation farmer, uh, Tom Cotter, and certified organic, along with a partner in our Superior Cannabis Company. I'm actually uh, also a member and board member on the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition that promote, helps farmers promote other farmers uh, how to take care of the land. And now and this is a you know, climate and water and legacy that we're talking about here. There's things that we can do out here in the real world and that's why I'm out in this field because I want to show everyone that the only way to grab water is truly to improve the soil. And, it's been said many times by at least four of these speakers already that hemp does heal the soil. And when we heal the soil, we can infiltrate more water. I, I really wish we had some carbon on here too because you can't capture carbon when you're in a greenhouse or a warehouse, you know, lighting, growing indoors. Outdoors is the only way to do it. And that's, that's how we grab the sun's wonderful free energy, put it in the ground, bring that carbon there. And the benefits in a land of 10,000 lakes is, you know, money-wise, it's endless because we are helping our communities and everyone stay clean. But grabbing that carbon for future generations, I'm actually out here in this field with my grandson, and that's why all of us are doing what we're doing for future generations. I really hope that we uh, look at the carbon side a little more, the water side, you know, wastewater. There is no wastewater when it's out in the soil. Out growing outdoors, that's the importance of outdoor growth is we are recycling those, that water cycle. We're putting it back in the aquifers. Most of the water now comes from rivers only because our aquifers have been dwindled down to nothing. Truly, if we grow hemp outdoors, we can get more water into the soil, more carbon, and that's just what I wanted to let you guys know. And the Minnesota Soil Coalition, we're a great farmer-led, and we work with MBA. We, we can help with outdoor stuff for the soil uh, at the pollution control. I really need that. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Any question from members? Okay, thank you, Mr. Carter, for your presentation. Uh, thank you. Next will be uh, Mr. David Benson uh, Stubler and help us correct, uh, help us with the pronunciation of your name in case I pronounce it wrong. Thank you. Hello, it's David Benson Stabler. I'm uh, a lobbyist today uh, speaking for SAVE and uh, the ANC, the Minnesota Anti-Narcotic and Anti-Addictive Drug Coalition. Um, my concerns uh, to raise to you today, I'd like to just touch on uh, Governor Ventura's uh, couple remarks, uh, but mainly to focus on uh, water and, and climate. Um, first of all, on climate, um, if there's no problem with uh, cannabis being green, then obviously there should be an amendment today from someone uh, to have a mandate that all cannabis production be uh, carbon neutral. Uh, there shouldn't be any problem with that. But most of the people speaking today are hemp farmers predominantly, 
um, which is very different than what most of this proposed industry would be, which is large industrial facilities growing indoor cannabis. Five crops a year would use seven times more water than a corn crop or a soybean crop, and it would pull all of that water from aquifers rather than corn or soybeans, which are sustainable. As Mr. Cotter said, the aquifers are already in a significantly uh, deprived state in much of the state. Um, easily 60% of the state has a fragile aquifer situation currently. Um, anyone in the metro is aware of the situation at White Bear Lake. Uh, they're talking about pumping water out of the river to support uh, water use in the Northeast Metro. Um, at the same time, here we are talking about a cannabis bill that would have industrial facilities in Maplewood and North St. Paul that would be using, uh, you know, water pulled from, from the aquifers as things as stand. So the, the situation is fragile uh, regarding aquifers, and there's an important difference to realize when uh, comparing corn or um, a cannabis facility in any of the areas where there's a sensitivity to the aquifer situation, which is that a corn crop only needs to supplement uh, water from the aquifer when there isn't precipitation. But generally, precipitation provides most of the water uh, required. And then there's other precipitation when there is no corn crop during the year, which can be absorbed into the soil and eventually you know, go back and feed the aquifer to some extent. So the impact of any of these facilities in a region with a sensitive aquifer, it could easily be set the equivalent to 30 corn, you know, corn farms of the same size. And so the equation where people are already having to um, you know, deal with lower water, water quality or pressure is very significant. And I've raised this at the Agriculture Committee and Senator Murphy, speaking on behalf of the bill at the time, said that this committee would address the situation of doing a water study and then coming back and reevaluating what needs to be in the bill in, cons in consideration of the aquifers. But it doesn't appear, appear that uh, Senator Port has carried forward that promise from Senator Murphy last, uh, just two days ago. And there's uh, well, there was no talk about, um, you know, a study to evaluate this consideration and how you know the impact of this bill. On the, the greenhouse issue, um, the outer limit of the um, micro business grow of cannabis, so just the, the outer limit of the smallest size uh, cultivation operation, so the 5,000 square foot outer limit that's provided in the bill. Um, according to leafly.com, which is a pro-cannabis website, a 5,000 square foot operation would use as much energy as 66 homes. So we're talking about a very significant amount of energy. Of course, uh, that you know, energy production you know is talked about being um, totally green in, in 2024. You know, that's that's a possibility. But energy usage is a factor, even if you are on totally green energy. And of course. Right now, we're talking about using more energy, which is, you know, not, would not be carbon neutral. So, uh, again, if there's no problem with carbon neutrality with this bill, which obviously is, would not be true at all to, to claim, then there shouldn't be any problem having a carbon neutrality issue. And I, and I think that that really should be um, considered. Um, if there is a climate emergency, as many people firmly state, and Minnesota needs to burden itself now economically in order to reduce carbon. How at the same time is providing more cannabis usage a bigger emergency that it trumps the climate emergency? Because that is what this legislation as it stands is saying, that increasing carbon output for production of cannabis so that more people can use more cannabis here, which is the result, is more important than greenhouse gases, et cetera. Another factor is some people use um, carbon dioxide to stimulate the plant growth in greenhouses. They can allow a little leaking 
there's nothing in the bill to say that if, if uh, carbon dioxide is pumped into these facilities, that they don't ensure that that it's not escaping the facility, et cetera. Um, you know, which would be a normal expectation. Nothing in the bill about that. So there are serious um, climate considerations, serious water considerations. Um, again, Senator Murphy promised that there would be, um, you know, an answer or a water study decided upon in this committee. Uh, so maybe Senator Port has, has an answer there. Regarding um, Governor Ventura, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, I appreciate it. Um, the, uh, the issues with the cost of, of medical often has to do with testing quality. Um, the, the measures to test, uh, you know, for impurities and, you know, as regarding dosage uh, with the medical products is much higher. So it's, it's not some kind of um, price situation uh, difference with it, you know, with market factors. And, uh, Mr. Mr. Benz, Benson Staber, um, you take as long as the governor, even longer than the governor himself. So I, we heard your point already. Any other point that you want to make? And, and you're a testifier, so we, the routine is whether you will you know, allow us to ask you questions. And we'll, we'll see if the members or the uh, uh, Senate report will respond to your answer. But uh, um, I, I probably won't make any prom promise here. I know that this bill tra 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 traveling forward. Uh, so uh, I, mainly I just want to see if you're at the point of wrapping up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to give a final thought here, um, which is that another point raised in the Agriculture Committee hearing was the constitutional infeasibility of this bill to license because the Minnesota Constitution guarantees that a person can sell what they grow, the petal clause of Article 13, Section 7. That would apply to any lawful product, which if you make cannabis a lawful product, as this bill would do, people can grow and sell. And of course, you know, if someone can say, I grew it, of course, that's a problem with, with enforcement. But the licensure scheme of this bill, as it stands, would be largely void. So this is not something to ignore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Benson Stapler. Um, any questions from members? Okay, we're going to our next testifier uh, here, Glenn uh, McElfresh. Hi there. Please stay uh, in there for the record. Yep. My name is Glenn McElfresh. Uh, Chair Her, committee members, and Senator Deport, thank you for allowing me to speak today on SF73. It's also an honor to testify alongside Governor Ventura. My name is Glenn McAlfresh, and I'm a co-founder of Plift, a hemp-derived beverage company here in Minnesota. Before owning our business, I was the chief compliance officer for a multi-state cannabis business with more than 160,000 square feet of indoor and greenhouse canopy across our facilities. I've run due diligence on dozens of indoor, greenhouse, and outdoor grows across the country. And before that, I was a bud tender in Colorado's adult use market when it began allowing adult use sales. My business partner and I specifically chose to launch a hemp-derived product instead of a marijuana-derived product in no small part because of hemp's minimal environmental impact. Hemp is usually grown outdoors and relies on rainwater for irrigation. Hemp doesn't require daily application of agricultural inputs like fertilizers and pesticides, and hemp doesn't require special temperature or humidity controls when it's grown outdoors. On the other hand, adult use marijuana is usually grown indoors, requires anywhere from one to six gallons of water per plant per day, daily doses of petroleum-derived fertilizers and pesticides, and robust energy-intensive ventilation and lighting systems in order for the plants to survive inside. Many cannabis cultivation facilities spend $50,000 per month or more on their utilities alone. <clears throat> Due to many regulatory requirements, the vast majority of adult use marijuana product production must take place indoors. In a mature adult use market like Denver, marijuana cultivation accounts for about 4% of Denver's annual energy consumption and 6% of its annual water consumption. Zooming out, marijuana accounts for 1.8% of all greenhouse gases produced in Colorado. For comparison, coal mining accounts for 1.6% of Colorado's annual greenhouse gas emissions. 
Minneapolis and St. Paul are about the same population as Denver. So if Colorado's consumption data is any guide for Minnesota's nascent adult use market, the cities could expect to consume an additional 4% more electricity, 14 billion gallons of water, and emit an additional 230 million tons of carbon dioxide annually. Choosing hemp was easy for our business, but we also respect and support other businesses who choose to launch marijuana-derived products. We think both hemp and marijuana will play an important part in Minnesota's zero carbon future. To be clear, we support marijuana legalization in Minnesota and urge you to consider how hemp can help achieve the environmental goals of marijuana legalization, especially considering the tremendous success of hemp-derived THC-infused beverages and edibles across Minnesota since last summer. Please consider how hemp allows businesses to produce more environmentally friendly THC products. Mr. Chair, members, and Senator Port, once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions from members? Okay, good. Well, thank you, um, Mr. McElfleisch, uh, for your testimony. Um, just want to get opportunity for uh, folks that are here and in the audience to see if anyone want to uh, speak on this issue. Um, we still have little time, and we want to try to get this done by 420. <laughs> So uh, no, no testifier. I don't know why people laugh, but <laughs> uh, so uh, any amendment from members, Mr. Chair. Good, good joke, by the way, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the little humor to lighten the mood today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a couple questions to start with, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Port. From the agency perspective, I'm thinking within this jurisdiction, DNR, PCA. Do we know what kind of total number FTEs your bill would require in those agencies and um, in what they're asking for in order to monitor the program? It's a pretty large program, so I assume there's a, a pretty high number there. So if you could just share that, that would be helpful. Senator Port. Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Icorn. Uh, it's, a, it's an important piece of the puzzle. I do have folks here from AG and I think the PCA. Um, I don't believe the DNR was able to join us today. Um, and would invite them up to talk about this. I will say that the, uh, they can probably talk to the FTEs. The specific uh, appropriations are not in the bill at this point because we were waiting for the fiscal note and we didn't want to have incorrect numbers in there. Um, those will be discussed once they come in, but invite the agencies to, to talk about the FTEs that they expect it will take. Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, the agency, please state your name for the record, even though we know uh, Mr. Johnson or... Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, for the record, my name is Tom Johnson, uh, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And uh, my understanding is that we do not have any uh, permanent FTEs that will be added. It will be about a half of an FTE um, for some business, small business assistance. Uh, and there will be certainly uh, an appropriation that's helping with the rulemaking effort that's at the beginning uh, in, the, in the first two years, I believe. So uh, for an initial appropriation to help out with the rulemaking that's mentioned in the, in the bill, and then about a half FTE uh, in, uh, through 2026, and then zero FTE uh, ongoing by 2027. Uh, Senator Icon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's helpful, and I know uh, the DNR folks aren't here, but if somebody from DNR is listening, if they could get that number to us, I think that would be helpful as well. And as we were on that question, someone from DNR enforcement walked in, and that just piqued my interest. Um, will DNR conservation officers, enforcement officers, be helping on the law enforcement side of this in any way, shape, or form? And does your bill plan for the need DNR to be compensated in such a way for them to do some of that work? Should they? Uh, have to assist in that work anyway. Uh, Senator Port. Thank you, Senator Icorn. And perhaps Council has a seek and find button that's easier than my bill. But I, I don't remember who specifically is listed out as enforcement. There are drug reg recognition officers um, in there. I can look for the page and we can definitely get that back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Port. Or did you have something, Council? 
Mr. Chair, Senator Eichhorn, there is a uh, appropriation in the bill to the Department of Natural Resources to implement the act, and I don't believe there are any specific sections in the bill that require new duties of the department, and so the assumption there is that that the money would be used just for them to do general enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and for the DNR enforcement folks. If there is anything you guys see, if that's something you could reach out to us about, just I know this bill has a lot more in the process to go, and that would just be helpful. I know I'll probably see this again in finance, and uh, just so we can understand that piece, I think would be helpful. I'll move on to the next thing. Um, as we're looking at, um, you know, this, this committee's jurisdiction would be, we, we, we talk about pesticides and additives and things like that, in general growing of things. Uh, what I'm kind of wondering is what kind of nutrients, additives, pesticides, pesticides do you think will be used and what kind of safeguards does the bill provide uh, to make sure that um, it's safe and environmentally sound and that the disposal of that waste is done in an environmental way? Senator Porto. Thank you, uh, Chair. I'm wondering if one of the farmers can speak to that, either uh, Angela Dawson on uh, virtual, or I think Sean Weber is here as well. He may have, no. Yes, um, Mr. Stanley can comment on that as well. Mr. Chair, members, there are provisions of the bill that are a little bit uh, more in the ag uh, jurisdiction, so I can't comment on them in detail, but there is a requirement that the new office create best management practices in conjunction with some other agencies regarding the use of pesticides, fertilizers, soil amendments, and plant amendments, as well as a requirement uh, that we talked about in Article 1, Section 8, that uh, the relevant agencies come up with provisions for disposal of uh, contaminated material. Uh, Senator, I Senator, I can, um, yeah, Senator I can, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that kind of answers that. I appreciate that. The next one I have is on kind of the water usage. We heard from one of your testifiers. I think it was the last one there saying the amount of water um, that that is used. And in looking at some some online data, it sounds like as much as six uh, six gallons per plant per day, uh, which is obviously water intensive compared to a lot of other crops that are grown. And so with that, there's there's definitely some concern. I know the plants will absorb a lot of the water, but potential water runoff. Um, and so in, in that kind of realm, I think it's important that we make sure that any water discharge is taken care of in a responsible way so that we know it's clean going back into the environment. So in that realm, Mr. Chair, I offer the A37 amendment. It's a small amendment if you'd like me to uh, talk about it as it's being passed out. Mr. Chair? Yes, Senator Khan, please explain. It, it simply would say, the A37 amendment simply says that uh, the standards must include a requirement that water must be filtered through reverse osmosis filtration system before it can be just discharged from any cannabis business. Again, as water is discharged, like we do in a lot of other industries, we just want to make sure that uh, any of those pesticides or anything that may have gotten into the water are uh, taken out before they go back into the environment. And so that's the amendment. We'll get a little time for Senator Port to um, discuss this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, yeah, Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Eichhorn. Um, speaking with the, the agency, this is typically done during rulemaking um, with other agricultural practices. There's conversations about what the runoff looks like, how it needs to be filtered, things like that. That is done through rulemaking. It is not in statute for any other crop. Uh, as far as they are aware, and so we would we would not want to single this out specifically. It, it would be a part of the rulemaking process, and I'd be happy to work with you to ensure that this is included in the rulemaking, but I would not be comfortable putting it in statute and would ask people for a no vote. Senator, uh, Senator Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Port, you know, over the last few years uh, in my district, I've been heavily involved with uh, some ag operations, um, some ditch work that has gone on in county dish processes. Uh, I even had a shrimp plant uh, that I've been working on pretty heavy. 
Um, all of those projects have required an EAW. Um, in fact, uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has been pretty effective with working with me on those EAWs. Can you tell me what the threshold is for water usage before an EAW is required? Senator Port. Thank you, Chair and Senator Lang. Um, no, I don't know what that threshold is. I'm happy to have someone from the agency come up and talk about it, but I think, again, this is a, a discussion that would happen during the rulemaking for the PCA, uh, just like they do have rulemaking processes. We're standing up a new industry. Uh, they will put up, they will put together all of those processes and make the rules before licenses are given out. Stanley? Yeah, I, I, I agree that we are standing up an industry. We have a 300 page bill in front of us that is substantial on practically every page. Um, I guess I'm curious, do you dispute the numbers that were given? I think it was by Mr. McElfresh. And actually, uh, Mr. Benson actually gave some pretty stick. And the only reason I'm saying that is because I have the same statistics in front of me uh, that have come from Colorado that, uh, you know, that I think that they quoted this in somewhat of a stage, but the environmental consultant from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment says there's obvious energy impacts to this. And this is, uh, you know, a pretty narrow scope from this committee's perspective. Um, if we're talking about 6% of the state's water usage or we're talking about 4% of just Denver proper, their energy being used, uh, can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, that's a pretty substantial amount of power and water we're talking about, not to mention the environmental impacts. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Lang. Um, you know, adding an entire industry to Minnesota is absolutely going to increase our energy use. Uh, it is a brand new industry that will span the state and hopefully we will, you know, provide significant job growth, significant business growth, um, primarily to communities who have been harmed by prohibition. There will absolutely be an increase in water consumption and energy use. I, standing up a brand new industry like that is, is absolutely going to add to that. Um, I, I would defer um, to see if, if my expert, uh, Leili Fatehi, has additional things to add, but I don't dispute that there will be um, increases in our water and energy consumption. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Leili Fadahi. I'm the campaign manager for MN is Ready. We're the state's largest and most diverse coalition of cannabis policy stakeholders, and we've been uh, uh, doing a lot of intensive uh, engagement with our stakeholders around the different policy provisions in this bill to ensure that it meets the um, myriad interests. Um, you know, I would not rely on a single statistic taken from a single study uh, different states have different climates. There are a range of different practices. Um, it may be that, uh, I don't know if Dr. Dabney is still on, but one of our you know, experts in cultivation um, may be able to provide you with more details on that. Um, but you know, this is exactly why the, yeah. it's delegated to the uh, agencies to come up with the appropriate um, you know, energy usage standards, and then for the applicants to have to provide that as part of their plan as part of the licensing process. It's uh, correct. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and correct. So that's why we have the author of the bill and a subject matter expert on the bill. I just asked if, you know, I, I agree, we can't use one topic, but you guys have the bill. You have a 300-pager in front of us. What's the water usage look like on this thing? What's the electricity? I mean, you should be asking this question of yourself prior to getting to this committee. This is something we're all sitting at the table ready to vote on. Senator, Senator I, I, I just like a question. Even if it's a range, give me an answer to the question. Senator Port. Ms. Fatehi. Uh, Mr. Especially Chair, if you don't Senator agree, if, Lang, if you don't um, I, I understand your question now that yeah. you have rephrased it. Uh, one of the, you know, the central policy goals of this bill is to eliminate the illicit market and replace it with a legal regulated market. Because the market has been illicit, we don't have measures of what the demand for uh, cannabis and cannabis products necessarily is going to be 
in this state. Um, this is, again, part of the reason why you need to have a regulatory apparatus that is set up such as this Cannabis Management Board that includes an advisory council, that includes people with expertise on these subject matters, including the commissioners of the departments with the correct jurisdiction, because as we come to learn what is the appropriate amount of supply that we need to produce in order to meet that product demand, that is going to have a bearing on exactly this question of you know, the resource consumption. It is something that will need to be reevaluated on an ongoing basis, and that is why there is this permanent advisory council and this requirement for the studies and the reporting back and the, the tracking of the information. Mr. Chair. Mr. Uh, Senator Lane. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. I think you're dead on right with all the studies and all the background. The problem is that this bill does a lot more than that. It legalizes it before you have those apparatuses in place. You don't, you can't, Check your speed limit if you don't have a speedometer, Ms. Fateh. My point. Uh, also, when it comes to regulating illegal grows, that's some of the issues that Colorado has come along as well. Somewhat of, I mean, that's, the, how do you regulate an industry you can't regulate? Ms. Fateh. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, you can't, regulate an illegal market once you create a licit market with rules of engagement and licensing. And that's the thing. I mean, it sets up for a regulatory agency to be developed, do the rulemaking, and then subject to that rulemaking, begin to do the licensing process. Licensing will not happen before a regulatory agency is set up and rulemaking takes place. So it is only after the regulatory apparatus is set up that individuals would begin to get licensed. For example, hemp was illegal until the Farm Bill legalized it uh, and put in place rules for its regulation, which were promulgated at a federal level, but also at a state level. Um, and once people started growing hemp, then our Department of Agriculture was able, through its additional authorities, to ensure that it was complying with the requirements of the statute. Um, and. You have a compliant industry that is, you know, as you have heard, is, is a, a vibrant and vital uh, portion of the economy. And Mr. Th th I, I would, again, Senator. I would agree with you if you weren't simultaneously rec <laughs> recreational use legalization within the same bill. I think that therein lies the problem. We're, we're jumping off the, <laughs> we're jumping off the, the dock before we know how deep the water is. Okay, Senator Port. Uh, I don't know that there was a question in there, Mr. Chair, but uh, I will say that prohibition is not working. It is harming our communities. It is significantly impacting particularly communities of color in our state. It is keeping alive a dangerous, illicit market which sells to folks under age and uh, has no regulation in order to either limit who sales go to or to ensure that the product that goes out is safe. Um, our bill sets up the regulatory framework, the office that will write the rulemaking, the licensing process in order to move us along that path. It also, at the same time, expunges the records of those who have been incarcerated for the prohibition of cannabis. It is a multi-step process. There is, uh, this is not going to happen overnight in, you know, one fell swoop, but we cannot continue to focus on a failed system that is harming our communities simply because we don't like taking the time to put the steps in place to make it happen. It is time for Minnesota to legalize, regulate, and expunge. We have to take those steps, and they are included in this bill, and I, I encourage support for it. Thank you. And uh, we're going to go to Senator Green and maybe back to the uh, author's amendment. Senator Icon, do you want to just go ahead with the amendment? Or uh, you if wanna... Senator Green has a question first, he okay. can certainly go ahead, but otherwise I'll talk to the amendment 
one more time before we move on from sure. it. Sure. Uh, Senator Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I might have other questions later, but to this point, uh, you know, we were, um, we were limited in this committee to asking questions about the environment. And we have asked questions about the environment and uh, the very, very high carbon output that could result from this. Uh, and there's been no talk yet about, uh, about whether or not our electric grid is gonna be able to handle the energy bill that was passed, let alone increased use from this. But the author has now stepped over those, uh, those limitations as far as uh, the environmental committee when she starts talking about other things. And I have many questions on, on what was happening in Colorado, uh, the increased crime, the increased deaths, and all those other issues. And so if we're going to uh, step outside those boundaries, I'm more than happy to do that. But thank, uh, thank are you. we, are we you, environment Senator or not? Green. No, we're, we're not. Thank you, Senator Green, for uh, uh, taking us back on track. So um, are you going to say the same thing to no. Senator Wisenberg? <laughs> okay, Senator Wisenberg. Thank you, Chair. Um, I did, I had a, maybe a question or comment. Um, I think it was Sean Weber with Crest River Cannabis uh, said, like, just wrote down what he said, with an increase in electricity, we will not have an effect on our grid. Um, and then Senator Port just said, absolutely, we're gonna have a large energy use increase. Um, now, we did just pass the 2040 bill, and this is environment and energy, correct? So, um, so I can talk about energy. So we just passed out the, we just passed the 2040 blackout bill, and people might not know this, but two years ago, um, we were 10 to 20 minutes away from blacking out when Texas blacked out because they had to get energy from us. Now, if there's going to be a, this big increase in energy with this and other places, that's something that we need to think about in this bill. Sen uh, Senator Wisenberg, uh, yes. is, is climate. Our committee is environment and climate, not energy. Climate. Okay. Yeah. Well, this deals with climate, though, too, because sure. um, this is going to increase greenhouse gases, so that's climate and we're using energy and that increases greenhouse gases. That deals with the climate. So, okay. yes, thank you. Thank, thank you for your remark. And I think uh, earlier Ms. Fatea gave that answer to some degree. So back to the amendment, thank, Senator Icon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I never imagined a, an amendment, a small amendment on reverse osmosis would have created such a diverse discussion, but thank you for that. So anyway, back to the A37, which, no, you're fine, Senator Lang. Um, back to the amendment on reverse osmosis. It was mentioned that, you know, it's up to us to set up that framework and the agency to create rules. I think this is important. It's part of the framework. We're going to direct the agency that water quality is so important that we should have reverse reverse osmosis for these. So I think it should be included. We heard Senator Lang talk about some of people in his farmland have had to deal with reverse osmosis type stuff to get clean water. We've seen it in our mining industries. We've seen it in industries throughout the state. So I don't think it's that much to ask, especially when a lot of times we do talk about how important clean water is. So with that, Mr. Chair, I would move the A37 amendment be uh, added to the bill and I would request a roll call, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, roll call is accepted. Uh, on Amendment uh, A37. Um, we, should we shall proceed. Chair Her? Uh, no. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Icorn? Aye. Senator Green? Yes. Senator House Child? Senator Hoffman? Excuse. Senator Kunish? No. Senator Lane? Aye. Senator Morrison? No. Senator Wiesenberg? Aye. Senator Hoffman? Okay. Um, the motion for uh, the amendment of A37 uh, did not prevail. Uh, there are four I and five nay. Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Senator Icon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm disheartened to see that um, we weren't able to get something that would help water quality since it's something 
that I thought was so important to this committee and something we talk about a lot and something that we try to force on a lot of other industries, but when it's something we, when it's something we like, the water quality apparently isn't as important. So I'm disheartened by that. But I do have one additional amendment, Mr. Chair, and then I'll move on to whoever else has something. Uh, we heard from the testifiers today, you know, some of the CO2 emission impacts, the water impacts, um, so I think it'd be important, like a lot of industries, we make them do environmental assessment worksheets. And I think that's something that the cannabis industry should also have to do. If it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. Um, and so in this case, as these facilities, they're gonna be large facilities, they should have to play by the same set of rules many other industries have to play by. So with that, I offer the A38 amendment, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, A38 amendments coming to you. And as that's being passed out, Mr. Chair, it just simply uh, creates a mandatory environmental assessment worksheet preparation uh, for cannabis cultivation facilities. And we can certainly discuss it. But before I forget, Mr. Chair, I'd like to request, request a roll call on this one as well. Okay. Roll call is taken. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Port. Thank you. Um, and thank you for this uh, amendment, Senator Eichhorn. Uh, this new industry setting up, same as every other industry in Minnesota with the licensing, is not exempt from the current, e uh, the, the current requirements to submit the environmental impact statements. Um, so they are already required to do this if they meet the requirements uh, that, are, that are laid out in, sta in statute. Um, so I this would be additional above what is necessary. Um, and, and I guess I would say it, it's not needed in the bill. It's already covered under the current environmental impact statement requirements. Okay, Mr. Senator, Chair. Senator Icon. I just want to make sure we, we get it correct. It's, a, it's an environmental assessment worksheet. So it's an EAW, not an EAS. Um, and again, you, you said it does at some point this could trigger the requirement for an EAW, but we want to, the reason for this is we want to make sure that for sure happens. We don't want it to wait for a certain number or whatever. We want to make sure that this does happen. So that's why we're putting it, want to put it into the bill to make sure that regardless of what that amount is, that this environmental assessment takes place. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my mistake on the name, you're right, it's an EAW. Uh, slip of the tongue. Um, there is, as far as I can tell, no reason to think that that law isn't currently being followed and being uh, required when the conditions are met. Um, I trust that that is happening when it is necessary and uh, don't, don't see why we would need to relitigate that. Yes, Mr. Fate. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair um, and Senator. Um, a grant of a license is a government action that would trigger the requirements under MEPA for there to be either an environmental uh, assessment worksheet or environmental impact statement, depending on how significant the potential impact is. Were that to not happen where it is appropriate, there are already administrative remedies as well as judicial remedies to enforce that. Um, so writing it into statute uh, you know, doesn't strengthen the ability for that to be enforced when it is already in required under the law. Senator Icon. Uh, Senator Lane. And, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Senator Lane, but uh, uh, let, let me um, uh, just want to insert in first that uh, let's not go off the topic of the um, amendment. So Senator Lane. I didn't before. I was dead on. <laughs> I made sure. Uh, Ms. Fate, you mentioned trigger. Uh, I guess I'd like to know what that trigger is when it comes to power consumption, water consumption. Uh, is it, I mean, if you disagree with some of the testifiers and the statistics they put out earlier, especially when it came to, you know, 30 corn farms of the same size as the statistic I put out, if that's not accurate, you know, please tell us what is and at what point in time does that EAW triggered? Um, Ms. Fate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Lang. My point is that 
there is already a mechanism that exists under statutory law where it is, there is an assessment to determine whether such a worksheet needs to be done. I mean, you know, so in terms of when is that triggered under a particular fact scenario um, that I'll leave to somebody from the agency to clarify, but there is already a mechanism for requiring environmental assessment worksheets when there is an environmental potential for an impact. And if that does not happen, there are both administrative and judicial remedies for it. Thank you, Ms. Fateh. Okay, so uh, let the clerk take roll call on this amendment um, of 838. Chair Her? No. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Eichhorn? Aye. Senator Green? Yes. Senator House Child? No. Senator Hoffman? Senator Kunish? No. Senator Lane? Aye. Senator Morrison? No. Senator Wiesenberg? Aye. Okay, the, the motion of uh, uh, the amendment, motion for the amendment of uh, 838 does not prevail, uh, with uh, four vote being yes and five no. So amendment is not adopted. Okay, any other? Uh, yes, Senator w Wisenberg. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I guess I have a little story about when I was out in Maine recently, um, as they grow uh, marijuana there. Um, they had like a 40 acre field of marijuana and there are people that stay there 24 seven in campers to make sure people aren't still in the crop. And they also had people on four wheelers constantly patrolling with um, four-wheelers and AR-15s. I guess, are we ready for that here? If this passes, are you going to be okay with people sitting by and protecting their crops so people don't steal it with firearms? Thank you. So I suppose you just share folks to f share with us your question, but there's no request of responding. And so um, any other comment or amendment? Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, Just a couple questions as we go along here, um, and I, I guess I'd open this up to anybody that's in the audience or want to answer on it. Uh, what's the average size of these uh, marijuana operations? I mean, is there going to be a limit to them? Uh, is there going to be a limit to how many facilities we have? I'm just, just out of curiosity, what are we actually looking at? I know I've asked some pretty specific questions about water usage and electricity usage. How many permits are you projected that they're going to pop up? I mean, that's something I think, you know, relatively speaking, Colorado has been a pretty good example that, uh, of what may or may not happen. I don't know. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Lang. Um, as is laid out in the bill, there's a couple of things that, that I, I will point you to. Um, first, the bill is not the same as Colorado's bill. Um, it is not the same as any of the other states that have legalized. We have taken lessons from each of their bills to help ensure that we have a bill that fits the needs of Minnesota. Particularly to the licensing piece, how many operations there will be, the short answer is we don't know because we don't know what the demand is. Um, and this bill is specifically targeted to uh, build a market that meets the demand um, that, that will happen here. It is set to do that over time. And is, it is set to do that in um, sort of steps. The first step being uh, a lens towards micro businesses and smaller operations, Minnesotans, communities who have particularly been impact, impacted here in Minnesota from cannabis prohibition. We do not allow large outstate uh, investors and owners until several years into the bill and then only if the demand requires. Um, so there are things we're doing in this bill to, to try to make sure that what we have here is an industry that's unique to Minnesota, is built to the demand of Minnesota, and is run by Minnesotans. 
Um, I, don't, I, I know it's not a perfect answer because part of the answer is we don't know, um, but hopefully that helps. No, not, not really, but <laughs> you, sorry, 300 page bill and we don't know. Sorry, laying in my Thank you, Mr. Saw. Chair. Yep. Uh, when you uh, say there's a limitation on size, what is that limitation? So there's, there is a limitation on out of state owners. Um, and there is a limit, there is uh, sort of a, a point scale of licenses. So you earn points for licenses based on several factors. One being social equity. Um, if you are in a community that has been um, impacted. Another is uh, like additional points for micro businesses. Uh, Sorry, wait, I think he's asking. Perhaps you're answering a, asking a different question than I think you're asking. Oh, I thought you were getting there, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll, and, and I'll see if Ms. Fatehi okay. reads your yeah. question differently than me. And uh, I, and go go ahead and answer the question, but we when go out out of to topic of our jurisdiction already. You know, uh, I think that the question posed by Senator Lane belonged to a different committee. But uh, go ahead, Mr. Fatehi, and then I think uh, if there's no after Ms. Fatehi tests. Uh, Answer if there's no uh, further question from members. Uh, Ms. Ms. Fate first, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Lang. Uh, the question, as I interpreted, you were asking had to do with what is that canopy size for setting the threshold. Uh, for what is a micro business versus a larger business. So for those micro businesses, uh, you know, their eligibility for that licensure category is based on the canopy size uh, of the operation. That is something that we are actively in the process of engaging with our cultivators, um, plus looking at the range of data to try to assess to the best that we can what will that initial demand that we need to meet be based on what we've seen in other states and such. Um, and then uh, we will determine what the, the appropriate canopy size is. I don't remember off the top of my head what number is stated in the bill. Um, it is under revision based on, on uh, consultation with the experts. May I comment? Okay, uh, someone online. <laughs> this is David Benson Stabler. I'd like to speak on this issue. Okay, um, Mr. Benson, please do so and uh, make it brief. Um, our, we have re reached the time of our adjournment, and so uh, since there's no amendment, you know, if after you're done presentation, we'll, you know, I'll make a motion to adjourn this meeting uh, because uh, we have to stay under the jur jurisdiction of our committee. Uh, some of the questions uh, that asked belong to other committee, perhaps in the job committee or in the finance and transportation committee. So. Um, Mr. Benson, go ahead and make it brief. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, in the Senate Ag meeting, Senator Murphy deferred that water issues should be addressed here, not in agriculture. So that is a point about whether the water aquifer issue is germane to this discussion. 80% of the operations currently in California legalized market is illegal groves, and they do steal water. This is rampant. Uh, the LA Times reports on it all the time. They use trucks and truck it in. They steal it out of reservoirs anywhere they can find it after they drain the aquifer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Point, point taken. Uh, so, uh, members and Senator Port, any last uh, remarks, uh, conclusion to yes, Senator Lee? Thank, so thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, and, and one final piece I'll put to that, the reason that we don't have a cap on how many licenses is because we do want to meet demand. What we have seen in other states that have capped licenses is that they don't meet demand, which specifically keeps an illicit market alive. It's also why we don't allow prohibition in specific pockets because that keeps an illicit market alive. Um, I know this is bordering out of the jurisdiction, and Senator Lang, I feel like you and I sh could spend uh, some time discussing this bill uh, in, in much greater detail, but uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I, I do have one thank final you. question. If um, Senator Green, and uh, thank you for your, your uh, con concluding remarks on 
Senator Port, thank you for your concluding remarks and my correction. We have till five in this committee, but we... Uh, uh, Senator, Senator, thank you, Senator, Mr. Chair, for the extra time. I actually thought you were joking when you said 4.30. I thought we were going till five, so I do have other questions, but I'll save those for the floor. But is uh, there a roll call on this, uh, on passage of this? If not, I'd like to request one. Sure. Um, roll call of this passage uh, of the Senate file uh, 73. Um, refer to the Trans Transportation Committee. Uh, so, um, roll call accepted. Uh, Senator McCune. I would like to move uh, that the Senate file 73 be um, um, approved and referred, I'm sorry, which committee is it going to? Transportation. And referred to the Transportation Committee. Did I miss anything? Uh, the clerk will take. There might be more questions, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure. I just have one. I have one. I know I had one before, but not that one. But... Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Senator Lane. Um, well, 80% legal grows. I guess, and this is maybe when it comes to water usage, and if, if we're even close on some of those statistics, which I hope we're not, but if there's 80% legal grows, what does this business or what does this bill do for businesses to stop that? I mean, have you talked about increasing penalties for illegal grows? Have you talked going down that? I mean, this is environment. We're talking about water, and that sounds like a lot of water. It sounds like a lot of power. Okay, back to the water questions. Go ahead, go, go, go ahead um, Ms. Fate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Lang, uh, illegal grows would remain illegal. They would be in violation of the law, um, and that is why there are the allocations that are made for enforcement. So I, I'm not, a, it, it does not seem like a fundamentally different situation than you would have in the status quo of having illegal grows, except you would have more of them now because there is no pathway for growing things legally and reporting uh, pursuant to your license. Lane, maybe you you could we could take the discussion offline. You know, you can ask uh, Ms. Fate to clarify. And you know, so uh, we're going to move on with the motion made by Senator McEwen, and the clerk will take the roll. We're going to do roll call on motion to refer um, Senate File Seventy Three to the Transportation Committee. Okay, members. Chair Her? Uh, yes. Senator McEwen? Yes. Senator Eichhorn? No. Senator Green? No. Senator House Child? Yes. Senator Hoffman? Yes. Senator Kunish? Yes. Senator Lane? No. Senator Morrison? Yes. Senator Wiesenberg? Okay, there's a five yes and four no. Um, the motion of Senate, Senate File 73 uh, re referred to Transportation Committee prevail. So thank you, Senator Port, and uh, safe travel with this legislation. And thank you, members, for the discussion amendment. The uh, Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy is now adjourned.